chill, chill, chilling worth, chill, chill, chilling worth. First word for chapter 10 is solace, which means a place of relief or sanctuary, of comfort. Um, the Puritans would never seek solace in the woods. They thought the woods and the wilderness was the place where naughty things happen, where the black man was there ready to write your name down in blood. But remember, this novel is written by a romantic, and the woods are a far more glorious and actually God-given God place. So you see that contradiction and paradox work itself out in this novel. Second word is somniferous, which means soporific, or something that puts you to sleep. It is my hope that these videos are not somniferous, that they somehow spur you to want to read and find out more about this most amazing novel. Palliate. Um, you might seek solace in order to palliate uh, some type of hurt that you might be having. It lessens um, the severity of wounds, either physical or emotional. Palliate. Chapter 10 is called The Leech and His Patient, but it also could be called The Leech and His Patience, in that um, Chillingworth takes his grand old time um, discovering Dimsdale's secret. In fact, you'll see in everything that Hawthorne writes about Chillingworth, um, you can see that Chillingworth derives this kind of, I don't know, diabolical pleasure at... Um, at really forcing the guilt um, to develop in Dimsdale. Not only just to develop, because it's already there, but Chillingworth, as you'll see in this chapter, simply mitigates and exacerbates it, just makes it larger, and is always prodding, always, um, I guess, mining for um, that diamond, or that coal, probably, in this case. As Chillingworth delves into the interior of Dimsdale's heart, uh, he makes the not so startling discovery that Dimsdale's not really a bad guy, that he has lots um, of admirable qualities, but paradoxically uh, this discovery of Dimsdale's being um, a kind of pretty upright fellow uh, seems only to drive Shillingworth further, um, to demand that he work harder for Dimsdale's destruction. Later, um, during one of these uh, dramatically ironic talks between Chillingworth and Dimsdale, uh, outside the window you see Pearl and Hester advancing through the graveyard, and Pearl there dances her way across the gravestones, kind of tap dancing over Puritan mores, and um, we'll talk about in the quote section some pretty excellent and very obvious symbolism, and we'll see some dramatic irony um, kind of bash us over the head. Hawthorne um, certainly doesn't really work with subtlety in this chapter. And as the chapter comes to a close, uh, we see Chillingworth spy something on Dimsdale's chest or whatever. As readers, we're not privy to exactly what Chillingworth saw on Dimsdale's chest, but certainly uh, we see Chillingworth at the end of the chapter dancing for a diabolical joy um, at the pain he is witnessing. Let's see what Hawthorne has to say about Chillingworth. Paragraph 1. He dug now into the poor clergyman's heart, like a miner searching for gold, or rather like a sexton delving into a grave, possibly in quest of a jewel that had been buried on the dead man's bosom, but likely to find nothing save mortality and corruption. Alas for his own soul, if these were what he sought. And then in paragraph 4. Then after a long search into the minister's dim interior, and turning over many precious materials in the shape of high aspirations for the welfare of his race, warm love of souls, pure sentiments, natural piety, all of which invaluable gold was perhaps no better than rubbish to the seeker, he would turn back, discouraged, and begin his quest towards another point. He groped along as stealthily, with as cautious a tread, and as wary an outlook as a thief entering a chamber where a man lies only half asleep. Remember that. So under Chillingworth's careful, um, deliberate, civilized, and calculating scrutiny, he discovers that Dimsdale is a pretty upright fellow who made a mistake, but unfortunately that mistake um, 
was with Chillingworth's wife. As Chillingworth gathers um, plants and herbs uh, for medicinal purposes, uh, Dimsdale questions him. Where, my kind doctor, uh, did you gather those herbs with such a dark and flabby leaf? Even in the graveyard here at hand, answered the physician, continuing his employment. They are new to me. I found them growing on a grave which bore no tombstone, no other memorial of the dead man, save these ugly weeds that have taken upon themselves to keep him in remembrance. They grew out of his heart, and typify it may be some hideous secret that was buried with him, and which he had better to have confessed during his lifetime. Um, perchance, says Mr. Dimmesdale, um, he earnestly desired it, but could not. And wherefore, rejoined the physician, wherefore not, since all the powers of nature call so earnestly for the confession of sin, that these black weeds have sprung up out of a buried heart to make manifi manifest the unspoken crime. That, good sir, is but a fantasy of yours, replied the minister. There can be, if I forebode all right, no power short of the divine mercy, whether by uttered words or by type or emblem, the secrets that may be buried with the human heart. In this dramatically ironic interchange, it's quite obvious um, what Chillingworth is doing, but it's also kind of remarkable that both characters kind of forward one of the themes, uh, that nature is prodding um, us to be honest with the world. And at the same time, Dimsdale, um, you know, in his Puritan um, ministerial duties, uh, believes confession to be something altogether different. But it is Chillingworth, um, the dark Chillingworth, who suggests that it is nature that forces the truth to come out. And in Chillingworth's way, and then countering with Pearl's sunshine idea about letting the sun shed light and nature shed light on the truth. So Dinsdale is pulled um, quite naturally by Chillingworth and his evil herbs and Pearl in her sunshine, as you will see, and from within and it tears them apart. As Dimsdale and Chillingworth do their own little dance around the truth, um, just outside their window, uh, in the cemetery of all places, Hester and Pearl happen to be passing by. Looking instinctively from the open window, for it was summertime, the minister beheld Hester Prynne and little Pearl passing along the footpath that traversed the enclosure. Pearl looked as beautiful as the day, but was in one of those moods of perverse merriment which, whenever they occurred, seemed to be remove her entirely out of the sphere of sympathy or human contact. She now skipped irreverently from one grave to another, until coming to the broad, flat, memorial tombstone of a departed worthy, perhaps of Isaac Johnson himself, she began to dance upon it. In reply to her mother's command and entreaty that she would behave more decorously, little Pearl paused to gather the prickly burrs from a tall burdock, which grew beside the tomb. Taking a handful of these, she arranged them along the lines of the scarlet letter that decorated the maternal bosom, to which the burrs, as their nature was, tenaciously adhered. Hester did not pluck them off. So there's Pearl, in all of her glory, dancing on the graves of the Puritan past. And that's rather poignant, actually. And then, in a not-so-subtle, actually, that wasn't subtle anyway, but a not-so-subtle moment of um, symbolism, dramatic irony, Pearl places Pricklebur's along the outline of Hester's um, scarlet letter. And then she proceeds to do what with them? Oh, I know, throw them at Dimsdale. Why? Who knows? But Pearl knows, and so do we. And so does Chillingworth. And so does Hester. And so does Dimsdale.